All right. All right. Uh, welcome to the class tonight. Um, I was just I was just realizing I think this is the first class uh, in a long time I've taught here in this building. Uh, the last one I think was at Jimmy's house during the bad weather. <clears throat> but that really doesn't matter. I don't know why I brought it up. Anyway, we're in uh, Paul's letter uh, to the Galatians, the Galatian churches. And we have finally made our way into the last chapter, chapter 6. And uh, we're, we, we spent the last class we had, um, basically we spent that in just verse 1. Kind of the end of uh, chapter 5 and, and we got into verse 1 and, and dealt with it. And then um, we didn't get into verse 2 at all. So tonight we probably will not get any further than verse 2. Because there's something uh, there that uh, I want to I deal with. And I, I've, I've just been struggling with, not with the verses, but how to... how to uh, express what I am understanding these verses to mean because there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> misinformation out there in commentaries and, and different places. Uh, let, let's read the verses before we get into all that. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, <clears throat> the reason I, I say I've had, I've had struggles with these verses is because when you... When you read people's commentaries about these verses and you uh, hear people talk about these verses, and I do go in sometimes in, in these classes, I have gone back and, and listened to some people, and, and I've, not people we know, but people uh, in different, different uh, types of theologies and uh, commentators and, and different people that have uh, spoken about these these letters and when they get to chapter 6 and, and they do that throughout the letter but especially when they get to this part they begin to take it outside of the context of this letter you can't understand what Paul's saying here when you remove it from everything he said previous to this when you think, well, he was talking about spiritual things then, now he's getting into the more practical things that we can do uh, or exercise one to another. That's absolutely not what he's talking about here. It is an exercising one to another, but it's, it's in the light of what he's been saying. So, again, to, to, to be able to say that and, and for people to at least grasp what I'm saying is... Uh, is a little struggle for me right now. Hopefully, with the Lord's help, we'll be able to do that. Just to kind of summarize the first uh, first verse that we looked at. Uh, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, we who are spiritual, restore such a one. We talked about what it means to be spiritual. It is not an elevated level for men. It does not exalt men. That term is not for that purpose. It's, it's basically <clears throat> dealing with those who are living in the government or under the government of the Spirit, under the governance and leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit, of the Spirit of Truth, uh, where it says he shall lead us. They are led by the Spirit. They are the sons of God. And the word led there means to be led to a goal, led to the very destination of the journey. So those who are spiritual have been by the Spirit of God and are being by the Spirit of God, because it's an eternal journey led by the Spirit, are being led 
to the goal, led to the one who is the end, led to the one who is the culmination and conclusion of the matter. And that's Christ himself. He doesn't lead us to that as something we have yet to come to. He leads us in him um, as the one to whom we have come, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Now, to be overtaken in a fault here, we, we've talked about that. There are some places that talk about in a trespass, uh, which is the word here as well, uh, if they're overtaken in a trespass. Um, I, I, I thought of it like this, to be overtaken, because the word there, overtaken, actually means to be taken in advance. It's, it's not just something comes and jumps up on you. It's something that's already in the works. It's already basically something that's present now being manifest towards you. Um, because to be overtaken in a fault, I, I look at it this way. That is basically dealing with that default setting in the human heart. Um, and I wrote here, it means to be taken. In other words, it's being brought under the power or taken by something that's already or previously been there or a disposition that is already present in the heart of man. There is a disposition in the heart of man. There is an inclination in the natural man. What is that? To lean toward his own understanding. The natural inclination in man is to look at himself, to attempt to understand and to see the evidence of, to see the proof of spiritual reality. And, and we're going to get to that because it has to do also in this bearing of one another's burdens. But when one is overtaken in a trespass... It's, it also uh, means to be surprised or taken unaware. And this is also true because these brethren didn't realize that the very thing that the Judaizers were putting before them as their hope was the very thing that was going to bind them, the very bondage. Uh, you know, we go, you go, go back to chapter, uh, chapter 4. And we dealt with chapter 4 where Paul says, Brethren, having, having known God, or rather, he corrects himself, says, Rather, the, the, the truth is known of God, that you've been known of God. Why do you now desire to be in bondage? And I thought, that is the weirdest wording in the world, desire to be in bondage. Who would, if they knew there was a noose out there to catch them by the neck, would walk right into it? Who would walk into a prison cell? And just say close, I mean, and desire to do it. Who would do that? Well, you, you don't knowingly. It, it comes to the human heart as a surprise. Why? Because the hope we have put, we have put our hope in the wrong man, in the wrong object. And then we are somewhat surprised when we become ashamed of the fact or are shamed by the fact that the very thing we put our hope in is the very thing that disappoints us or is the thing that binds us, brings us into abject slavery and bondage to flesh. It's kind of like uh, Eve looking at the tree after God had said, do not eat of it. But she looked at it, and what was it? It was desiring. It, she desired it. It was something to be desired. But what did it do? All it did was open their eyes to themselves and made them self-aware. It brought themselves, the eye, into view so that fellowship with God was, was lost. And now their view of them, their, they began to define God's view of them by their view of them. So, anyway, and it has to do with all of that. Trespass is really, and, and I was talking in one of the classes, uh, I, I said that, but uh, to, trespass is actually to be where you don't belong, where you don't have a place. 
You try to put yourself where you have no place. And I've been looking at that lately in, in different types and figures, in Korah's, in Korah's rebellion and, and Adonijah, and we'll look at some of those things tonight because they're mentioned in some verses uh, in the New Testament that I'm going to look at. But you see them trying to usurp and take to themselves a place and a relationship that doesn't belong to them. It belongs to another. It belongs to the one God chose. And they desired it. So we, we dealt with that in the last class. I'm not going to get into that too much. But, but Paul says if you find your brother, first of all, here's the first thing you have to be able to do. You have to be able to identify when your brother is in a trespass. Here's where I have not really understood, and this is something that stood out to me. You have to first be able to recognize your brother is in a fault, that your brother is trespassing, or that you're in a fault, but bearing one another if you find your brother in a fault. You have to know, you have to be able to recognize when he's in fault and when he is Paul understood when Peter was. Most of us do not even understand when those who are in our midst are in a fault. Well, leave that. But there is a way to tell, and it has to do with this very thing, thing that we're going to talk about. A soul that is continually, and this is the one out from whom the restoration that's called for here comes. One that is continually being faced with and is facing inwardly that great crossing over from one man to another, from one creation to another, that great transition, let's say it, the great judgment, the dividing between that God has brought about. It's a soul that is living in a continual acknowledgement, a continual experiencing of that great division severed me from my mother's womb. That great severing, that great sanctifying work of God, it is that one who's living in such an awareness of reality that can call a brother back to the reality who has stepped outside the boundaries of it. But here's the thing about restoration. Here's the thing we miss. Restoration can never have that person as its object. The moment you put restoration, you put the, that brother or that sister as the object of the restoration, you have just messed it up. You've perverted it. Now you've restored a person to something. Restoration has to do with the fact of restoring him to the reality that it is not him, but Christ who lives in him. Restoring him to a, it's setting him back where he already is. It's, that's the Greek word, restoring, set back like a limb that's just out of, a, out of alignment out of agreement with the rest of the body. And you're setting them back. You're not bringing them back to something they left. You are bringing them back into agreement to where they've always been. So how do you do that? You hold the head. You have to hold the head yourself from whom every joint receives its supply. So that that brother who is now out of alignment, you can bring him back in as one who is holding the head. You can bring him back in and bring him back into the understanding or at least direct him to the Spirit of God. Direct his heart back to the reality that is his actual condition, that is his true state of being. Otherwise, we're just trying to bring people back and, 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 and get them back into a situation so that they can adjust to the situation. We're trying to make that person better. 
No, that person needs to see Christ. And you who are seeing Christ, who are spiritual, can bring that brother back to the alignment, to the reality, to the fact you must see him. He is your life. You will declare the reality you are knowing to that brother. But if you're not knowing that reality, what do you have to declare to them? And how can you restore him? How can you set him back in alignment when your own soul is not in alignment with reality? And that's why I said, Paul is not condemning those in fault. He is showing and demonstrating to these Galatians the necessity of continuing on in reality. So that they would be standing firm. And when they see a brother in such a fault, what's the fault? Seeing anything other than Christ. Looking unto anything other than Christ as life and as righteousness. Setting your heart short of him. That's the fault. And it has to do with that, that default setting in our heart. Stated Paul is not correcting it. I'm going to read some here. Paul is uh, not correcting those in fault, but he's actually laying forth the great necessity of continuing on into a greater and more perfect seeing of Christ. The necessity of living in a perpetual appearing of Jesus and in the clarity of his presence. The necessity of standing firm, established in faith, so that we can continually be accessing by faith the grace in which we presently stand. And in such a case, we can restore, we can call our brothers back into a reality of union with Christ. And if that is our state, when we, if we're by faith accessing the grace of God which is not I but Christ liveth in me if we're understanding that and that is our soul's establishment the anchor of our heart then we'll be able to recognize when that's not our brother's understanding but we don't condemn him for it we declare to him his true state of being we declare to him that his life is Christ. And we do it from a, st and we're able to bear. See, that's what bearing, bearing the weight. And we're going to get to the burden, what the burden truly is. Uh, here in, 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 in the next verse. But the restoration has to be in the light of reality. It's not just, hey, this brother wants to come back in the fold. Let's get him in quick before he changes his mind. <laughs> you know? The restoration has to be in light. It has to be in truth. And it has to be a judgment. Everything of this is about judgment. Not I but Christ is a judgment. And if I'm not walking in that judgment, I cannot declare that judgment as your reality. And when I do that, I am love, and we'll get to that. When I'm doing that, when I am calling a brother back to that reality, when I'm calling a sister back to that reality, guess what I'm doing? I am loving them with the love with which God has loved us. And we'll get to that in a second because that's what fulfilling the law of Christ has to do with. <clears throat> we are spiritual. Restore such a one. See, because... Paul understood the foolishness of what, what this is. The foolishness of attempting to uh, achieve a righteousness instead of seeing and knowing Christ as your righteousness. He knew how foolish it looked. And I'm going to show you how foolish. I want you to see this picture. Okay? Here's a picture. I'm going to draw it on the board. I can't draw it the way it's said in the scripture because it would take too long. I, I was telling them about that earlier. But I was thinking about this uh, type and shadow. So number 16. This type and figure. And I was looking at the Galatians in, in relation to it. 
And here is Paul understanding it is not I that liveth unto God, it is Christ living in me. The only life God receives is the life he has provided as his son. The only righteousness he accepts is the righteousness that is his son in me. You understand? It is not I but Christ. Now again, that carries a great judgment to it. Now, here's this picture in number 16, and we all know, or most of us would know, this is when Korah and the 250 with him stood against Moses and Aaron. And, and they come to Moses and Aaron, and basically they're, these are priests as well, they're Levites, uh, or they're priests, and, and they take, at least they're priests, and they come to Moses and Aaron and say, who do you think you are? You think way too much of yourself. Now this is the conversation. You can read the whole thing. But this is basically what they say. You put yourself above everybody in Israel. And think that you are the only ones that can have a relationship with God and stand before God holy. He says, he told Moses and Aaron, he said, all of Israel is holy. All of us are holy. So Moses hears this, and he falls on his face. Because he knows what they've just done. He not only knows the foolishness of what they've done, he knows the danger of what they've just done. He knows what they have just stood up in contradiction to, what they have just stood in opposition to. What is it? They're only standing before God. Their only relationship God has for them. And they're standing in opposition to it. See, I think what the, I don't know, I could be wrong, but when I think about this, I, it's such, a, it's such a, an immense thing when I look at it and I just think, man, this must be what it means. Pride comes before destruction. What is it? It's the pride of the human heart. I can stand before God too. I can stand accepted. I can be righteous. I can be holy. Man, that's pride. I will ascend above. Isn't that the Father? You're of your father, the devil. <laughs> but anyway, here's this picture. Well, Moses falls on his face and begins to speak to Korah and unto the 250 that are with him. And he says this. He says, even tomorrow, this is verse 5 of number 16, even tomorrow the Lord will show those who are his or show who are his. Now, the Hebrew says it this way, not the King James, but the actual Hebrew says, the Lord will know those that are his. Paul says that in Timothy, that the foundation of God standeth sure, having this as its seal. And the seal there means signet, or it can also, it, it means signet. Well, it, it, when, you, when you study it, it comes right back to the miter on the head of the high priest who was engraved holy unto the Lord as a signet. Engraved upon that miter was holy unto God. And guess who wore it? Aaron. The very one they're standing against. Now, there's a lot to the story, and I, I don't have time, but that's the foundation. God knows that are his, those who are his. How does he know it? In the head of the high priest. He knows the one who stands before him, and therein, and thereby, he knows Israel. So, there's the security of the whole thing. There's the reality. Him living in the midst of Israel. As their relationship with God. 
Because again, we've said it many times, God only has one relationship in which he participates. One. So, here's what Moses says to him. He will, he will uh, show who are his, who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him who he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, verse 6, take you censors, Korah, and all of his company, and put fire in it, put incense in them, before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. And then he says, you take too much upon yourself, ye sons of Levi. You think too much of yourself. You think you have a place that you don't have. Remember, Paul's going to get into it in, in, in a few verses down here, not too far from where we are in chapter 6. And he says it this way. If a man thinks that he is something, when he is nothing, he is deceived. What are these brethren? What are these people, Korah, the Levite, what are they doing? They're thinking they're something when they're nothing. And they're standing against the very security of their soul. And we do the same thing and don't even realize it. Here's the picture. And I saw this. No wonder Paul says, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Look at the foolishness of this picture. Here you have 250. I can't draw 250. Here's a censor in his hand. But here's all of these people. 250 with one goal, one ambition. Not to serve Aaron but to stand before God themselves. Because Moses says to them, is it nothing to you that God has called you out of the congregation to serve him? Now you want the high priesthood as well? You can say that to the majority of believers out there. Is it nothing to you that you are found in Christ having him as your righteousness? Do you want righteousness too? Is it not enough to you that God has shed his love in your heart in the very person of his son? Do you have to be loved also? It's the same picture. Here's all of these, all of them, all of them. 250 Levites standing here with their own little censers in their hand. They have the right incense. They have the right fire. And they have legitimate censors. And here's one. Here's the one. With the miter on his head. And look at this picture. 250, it's an ugly picture, don't look at the picture, look at the... Imagine the better picture in Scripture. <laughs> 250 men with a fleshly ambition. And one chosen of God. One who stands with the crown on his head that says, Holy unto God. Foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Having begun in the spirit where he stands before God on your behalf, are you now going to have something before God of your own? That's the foolishness we're dealing with. That's the trespass. That's the trespass. How do you restore a brother out of this trespass? You call him back to Aaron. You call him back to obedience to the one that is known of God. Call him back to reality. Well, that's a little picture of it.
such foolishness is the outworking of a soul that remains blind to the security of our union with the one. Security of the one spirit of the Son of God living in us, being made unto us what we may deem to be deficient according to our self-assessments, our self-centered views. What we think is lacking because where we're looking for reality is not where reality is found. We're looking for ourselves and our actions, our activities, our attitudes, our words, our deeds. We're looking there for perfection. You only see perfection in the high priest, in the one. And when that becomes the government of your soul, then all the other stuff falls into line. But those things are never the proof of reality. They're never the evidence of reality. That's the whole point here. The Galatians have, have attempted to make the flesh and what they do in their flesh the evidence of reality. Why? Well, there is always... I thought I wrote it here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to that. So now Paul speaks in that view of bearing one another's burdens. Bearing one another's burdens. I won't. Make you look at this ugly picture. So what is this? We have to understand what the burden is. See, most people will look at that and say, well, you know, if if, if they're depressed, we go up to them and we we show them we love them. They had a flat tire. Their mother-in-law hates them. That's a burden, right? No, it's not the burden. What is the burden? Because... The word there, and I had it here, uh, yeah, burden. That's it. One another's burdens. Here it is. One another's burdens. The word burden, of course, means a weight. Uh, it means other things, but, but, but something that weights you down. A load. But the word for one another is interesting because it also means what is mutual, what is shared, what is common to one another. So it's not just saying, you know, your brother has this burden and you have that burden and here's this burden and you got to just, when that brother has burden, you go over there and help him carry that burden. He's actually saying, We bear the burden that is common to all of us. We bear a burden that is shared between us. We have the same burden. We have the same burden. And this is the thing that I've been thinking about the last few days. It is a burden that we all share, a burden that is common to every single one of us. What is that? It's the burden of being human. It's the burden of being born of the seed of woman. 
It's the burden of being born of the kind of Adam. Now, see, I'm not discounting going to your brother and helping them when they got problems, but I'm telling you this is not the burden he's talking about. The burden he's talking about is that common burden that we all have and that we all must be in a position where we can bear that burden when it's evident in one another, when they have trespassed into that default setting that brings them under the weight of that one burden of being me, being I, being human. See, this is part of the liberty. In chapter 5, the liberty wherewith you've been freed. What is the liberty? It goes right back. None of this can be interpreted outside of Galatians 2.20. Not I. That's the liberty. What's the burden? I. <laughs> What's the burden that we all share? The burden of the I. The burden of me. The thing that weighs me down and keeps me bound to earth keeps me bound to what falls short of the glory of God. It is ingrained in the nature of man. A propensity, a natural disposition to look at ourselves to answer a spiritual question or to give a spiritual meaning. To seek after something less than what is Christ. To get weary in our good progress or our well-doing, as he will say here in chapter 6. Because it is so foreign and unfamiliar to us. So we stop that progress in seeing him and we turn back to what is according to our natural inclination. What is according to our familiar default. It's the burden. Now, before you think I'm crazy which you already probably do. Let's go to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10. First one, I'll read a, read a few verses here. 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 10. Starting in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, yeah, never mind. I was reading some of verse 9, uh, or chapter 9. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank out of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Now, First of all, Paul begins to expound this great reality of them coming out and drinking this drink and eating this meat and that there was this rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Here he first sets it off by saying this was the reality. This is what God did. He provided. He supplied. He, I mean, all of this good stuff, but he, then it gets to this. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness, overtaken by a fault. Here it is, overtaken, overthrown in the wilderness. These things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What evil things? Well, we'll see it, but basically it's settling for anything less than what God had already given them. And promised them something less than him. They lusted after evil things. Neither be ye adulterers as were some of them. As it is written, people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication. And that, that verse in verse 7 was when 
they were there and, and they uh, had built the calf, calf out of gold. Verse 8, let, neither let us commit fornication. <clears throat> Some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Verse 8, going back to, to uh, Numbers 25 verses 1 through 9. And I, I found it very interesting when I was looking at those verses. You go back to Numbers uh, uh, 25 verses uh, 1 through 9 and then you look at Numbers 24 and what was that? It was Balaam. Balak had told Balaam, you know, curse Israel. Well, God changed that. God opened his eyes. And when he looked out and saw the tents of Israel, he said, I cannot bless what, I curse what God has blessed. And he began to talk and declare these things concerning Israel. I see him from the hills, I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, shall not be reckoned among all the nations. I have received commandment to bless. He, he hath blessed them, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with them. The shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath as it were the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. There is, uh, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said Jacob, of Jacob and of Israel, what hath God wrought? All of this wonderful things that he was, uh, I mean how... He, Bala, I'm going from chapter uh, 23 to chapter 24, but here's chapter 24, uh, verse 2. Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took upon his parable and said, Balaam the son of Baor has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, he, he has said, which heard the words of God which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. This is where he also says, Blessed is he that blessed thee, and curses he that cursed thee. I mean, all of this, he sees Israel in their encampment, and God's blessing is on them. He can't bring a curse upon this. And then the very next chapter, chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. That's right after this beautiful thing of Balaam looking at their tents and declaring the blessing of God on them. Now they're committing whoredom and joining in in idolatry. As the Lord said to Moses, take all the heads of the people. Hang them up before the Lord against the sun and the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And we know what happens. And, and then one of the priests goes in and kills uh, Kills uh, Zimri, who was who was uh, committing whoredom with one of the Midianite women, and when he killed them, the plague was gone. The, everything was over. What what what's the answer to this? Here's here's where I'm going. What's the answer to the whole thing? The cross. The killing of that which is an offense. The killing of that which stands in opposition to the reality. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, we're in, right? Now. Neither let us tempt, this is verse 9, 1 Corinthians 10. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted were destroyed of serpents. Remember that? The serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Neither all, all, now all of these things happen unto them for our example. Uh, 
that they are written for our admonish, admonition upon whom the end of the world, ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now here's the verse. He gives all of these types and figures of them falling short, committing whoredoms, committing idolatries. And here's the point of all of that. There's one answer to every one of these situations that he, he points to. Every one of these, there was one answer to it. The cross. And we can't get into all of it, but where they were killed by the destroyer, everybody references that back to those with Korah. Those that stood against Aaron and Moses. And the crazy thing, I mean, this is just how insane the natural mind is. The crazy thing is after 250 men get swallowed up and consumed by fire, <laughs> the next day more people come against Moses and Aaron and say, you have killed God's people. God told before that, said, you take all of the censers that these 250 had in their hand, he said, and you hammer them out and make one plate out of them and you put it in the tabernacle so that it will be a memorial. What's the memorial? One seed will stand before me, and that's the seed of Aaron. Does, is that not enough? And here's these crazy people just like us that say, wait a minute, you did, that's not right. And then God says, Moses, y'all get out of the way. I'm a fixin' to take these people out. And he starts a plague, and they just start dropping like flies. And Aaron gets that censer again. And he runs in the midst of them. And the end of it says, and he stood between the living and the dead. See, that is not I but Christ. That is the great line of division. He's it. The temptation, the burden that we bear is that burden that such temptation can come upon us. And here it is. I'm going to show you. There hath no temptation taken you. This is verse 3. After all of these types and figures, here's the conclusion. Here, or here's, here's where it comes to with, with Paul. There has no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. <laughs> I mean, Paul understood. We all bear the same common burden, brethren. And that is being human. And what does that mean? Being ignorant of spiritual reality and desiring to put our foot where we don't belong or trying to bring God down to our level. To have God relate to us in a relationship he will not enter. This temptation, brethren, has come to you. It is common. It's mutual. It is shared. What do we said in Galatians 6? It is a mutual, common burden that we all share because we are human. This temptation is always there. It's always there. What is it? To look short of Him. To look at ourselves. An attempt to take a place before God that we don't have. To have what is mine own instead of as Paul finally come to rejoice and says, I count it all as loss that I may be found in him. Not having mine own, not having my own censor to stand before God, but having what he has made unto me by faith. What is that great temptation? But here's the Here's the beautiful thing. 
Paul doesn't stop there. Because the same answer in all of these types and shadows was the same answer Paul's about to give us. The temptation that is overtaking you, brethren, is common. It's human. That's what the Greek word there is actually human. It's a human temptation. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation. Now listen to this. This word with, it means simultaneously adjoined to. With the temptation, also make a way to escape. That you may be able to what? Bear it. And this is the same reality in which you'll be able to bear one another. In this same temptation and this same burden. What is the way of escape? It's the same answer of all of these types of shadows. What is the way of escape? The Jameson Fawcett Brown states he makes the way of escape simultaneous to the temptation. When the temptation comes into your heart, what is the response? Where do you look? What is the first response of your heart? The orientation of your soul? What's, what's when the temptation to look at something short of Christ comes, what is your response? Remember he says that the only ones that can restore these brethren who are in this fault are those who are spiritual. Remember again in chapter 5, he says in verse 8, I think it is, those who are spiritual, those of us who are spiritual, we do wait For the coming of righteousness by faith. See? That's the answer to the temptation. Isn't it? Because truly it's this. It's standing upon this ground. What is the way to escape? What is the way of escape provided simultaneous to that human temptation? That human temptation we all share. That's why I cannot restore you in anything but a spirit of weakness according to chapter 1, verse 1. Because I considered myself, word scopeo, I have scoped out the entirety of myself and seen I am just as vulnerable to this temptation as you are. Why? Because I'm human. And the only, the only defense I have, the only escape I have to this temptation, to this burden, of being man is the cross. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. Is that the, the, the response of the heart when there is a temptation, when you look here to look at yourself? When reality calls for the seeing of the Lord, but your heart... Or that human temptation is to look at you. Is that simultaneous with the temptation? Is it, does it arise in your heart and say, no, I am crucified with him. I have no life but Christ. I have no righteousness but Christ. Only those who are living in that reality can restore anyone who is under that same burden and that same temptation. That's why I said it's not a rebuke to those who are fallen. It is an edification to the responsibility we have to continue on in the seeing of the Lord. And to be established in security and reality. This is the immediate, immediate response that comes in a heart that is constantly in view of Christ and his sufficiency. This is the escape. The cross by which one man, one world, one creation is crucified to me and I unto it. It is a soul living in the good of and the realization of the eternal and final judging between. And thereby we can stand in the face of temptation that is common to humanity and bear it. And bear one another in it knowing 
that our souls have been severed from that humanity, from that man that was susceptible to such temptation. In such sureness and certainty, we who are spiritual wait in the certainty of expectation on his appearing. And that's what we tell those who are in this fault, in this temptation, under this burden of humanity. We call them back and say, wait. He's in you. He is your life. The posture of your heart should not be, I'm going to look out here to try to find a righteousness. It should be waiting on the appearing of him who is. Um, I'm about out of time. I, 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 I'm... I'm I hope I'm not confusing anybody. So what is this fulfilling of the law of God? And I'll get to that quick and then we'll be done. What it is not is Paul saying, if you do this, then you fulfill the law of God, of Christ. It's the law of Christ, it says. Because that is in total contradiction to everything he said in this letter of the inability to fulfill the law and do the law. Uh, it, you know, you have to go back to chapter 3. Uh, the law was a schoolmaster under Christ, all of that. But here's the real. Uh, Romans 8, 4. This is part of it too with the fulfilling of, of the law of Christ. This is part of it. So that that takes us to Romans 8, 4, which speaks of the righteousness of the law being fulfilled in us. Not by us, but in us. By the life of another. But he goes on and he says, it's fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh. And the word there is not in agreement to the flesh, but in agreement with the spirit. God totally removing me from one kingdom into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm, I'm trying to skip, skip real, real fast. But l this goes to uh, Galatians chapter 3. And here's the answer to it. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. What is it about? How are we fulfilling this law? We're fulfilling this law by living by the life that is the fulfillment of the law. And if I'm living in the realization of Christ as my life, and that does because it's right here. In that life, righteousness is found. In that life, holiness is found. Because it says, it doesn't say if the law could have given righteousness. It says if the law could have given life. The righteousness of God is bound up in the life he's given. It's about living in the realization of life. Not us doing something to fulfill the law of Christ, but us living in the reality of Christ living in me as the fulfillment of the law. Now, uh, I went way too fast through that, but, but here's where I wanted to get with this. In such a realization we are knowing the true love of God in its full measure. Because the law of Christ is truly fulfilled in love. But we must understand love. So that in love we may bear those who are weak and whose faith is being troubled or disturbed. Bearing one another's burden is actually the result of our knowing and living in the reality of the love of God wherewith he has loved us. That's what I was saying a while ago. To call you back to this reality is me truly loving you as God has loved us. That's why Paul says at the end of Galatians 2.20, remember it? Remember that? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. In the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. 
Why? Why does he bring love into that picture? Because the cross is the love of God. The cross wherewith God has eliminated and removed every obstacle to relationship with himself. What obstacle? Me. He removed the obstacle to relationship, which was me. And what did he do? Chapter 4 of Galatians says it. He gave us the very spirit of his son in us crying, Abba, Father. But when we're ignorant of that life that he has given, the very son of his love that he's provided, and the fullness of that, we will produce our Ishmaels. We will try to bring Ishmael into the picture. We will try to, you see what I'm saying? We will try to get together with Hagar and produce the promise. And that's the fault. That's the bondage. That's the burden that these brethren are in. And he's saying if you see them in this burden, you who are spiritual, you who are living in the realization of Christ as your everything, call them back to that. That's what Paul's doing in this letter. He's calling them back to reality. He's not condemning them for being ignorant. He's declaring to them the reality that they have fallen from. Remember from whence you have fallen. Bringing their remembrance, bringing to their remembrance the reality in which they already live. So what is this love? God has removed the obstacle that stood between making such relationship with himself impossible. The I. That's what it means when it says that he has torn down the middle wall of partition and the ordinances and the commandments that were against us, nailing it to the cross. He didn't take the Ten Commandments and nail them up there. He nailed the man in his flesh, the man over whom the law had dominion. That's why he could get rid of the middle wall. I'm the middle wall. <clears throat> Jew, Gentile, didn't matter. Man, he took that man in his flesh and he removed the obstacle. The enmity, it says. Crucifying it. Bringing one new man forth and thus making peace. If we are knowing and living in the good, in accord to the love that has removed all but the son of his love, all but the one. Remember the picture. And that he has made that son unto us all that pleases and satisfies his heart. We can truly bear those who are not yet experiencing that love who are stepping outside of the boundaries of the love of God or falling from grace. We who are being secured in him as our life, who are beholding the exclusivity of God's knowing, when we see those who are attempting to stand before God with their own censers in their hands, being ignorant of the sureness and security of the one who stands holy before God, we can call them back to the secure ground of not I, but Christ. When we see those who have had the I brought back to the center of their view, who have fallen prey to that common human temptation to look again at themselves, we who have discernment, that is nothing more than who have faced the judgment and are facing that judgment. And in there, in, therein are having our senses exercised and being able to discern between both good and evil. Now we could stay there forever. Because good and evil in the Hebrews 5 doesn't mean the same as we think. One means falling short and the other means the exceedingly great. Between what falls short and what's lacking to what is exceedingly great and exceeding and more excellent. When we have such discernment, we can call them back unto their true state of being and declare to them and show them the necessity of waiting on the appearing of the one 
who has the mitre upon his head and who has the breastplate of judgment on his heart so they can stand in the absoluteness, the clarity, and the rest of knowing the one who lives unto God and who stands in the presence of God for us, in us. And that's why it goes in the very next verse again. Well, we already said it, but if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. It's a matter of seeing him or seeing you. That's what it comes down to. Those of us who are seeing him, we should be able to minister life to those who are having their view deviated unto themselves. And correct. And direct their hearts. Not just not correct theology, but direct their hearts back to the reality. Direct their hearts back to the necessity of seeing the one who is made unto them. Everything that they're trying to make themselves. Call them back into the boundaries of union with Christ. Call them back to the security of being found in Him. Having nothing of our own. No censors in our hands. Well, see, uh, I'll stop here, but uh, you see, when we see someone doing these things, it is because, you know, I know myself, I, I've, I've been there. You, you can get caught off. You can get thrown. When you're immediately faced with someone doing these things, I'm talking about, you know, religious or whatever, or, or anything else, falling from reality. We can be thrown. And, and most of the time what we're thrown to is just that, that uh, real familiar thing, you know, that, that we know to tell people. Well, you just need to, or you just need to, or you just don't need to, you know? I mean, that's what's familiar to us, and is that the default, man? Is that the default we go to? Or are we standing in reality? And are able to declare to them their true state of being and declare to them the necessity of seeing the Lord who has made unto them all spiritual fullness and set before them a true hope a true expectation where they will no longer be tempted to place their hope in the flesh, but place it in the appearing of the Savior, the blessed hope, the true expectation. All right, well, I probably confused you enough. I'll stop there. <laughs> I saw a shirt the other day. Uh, what did it say? Chaos and confusion. My work is done here. Yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Appreciate everyone who is with us tonight. And uh, appreciate those who aren't with us either. But uh, we appreciate the ones that are with us more. But uh, we'll be uh, what, back Sunday Sunday morning, I think, is the next, that next class. Yeah, Sunday morning. Uh, 10.30 Central Time, so that's 11.30 Eastern Time. So uh, we'll be here up and running. We're, we're working, still working on the 24-7 channel, so uh, we're thinking, you know, by the end of the month or the first of next month, we'll have it going. We're retweaking our website as well. And uh, John's helping us. We're, we're getting him some stuff so he can start the changing the looks and also changing the, uh, the, um, the navigation on the website. We're going to try to make it a, a lot easier to navigate, uh, have everything right there in front of you so you can go right to it. But on the home page as well, we're going to try to put the 24-7 television screen or the mo uh, little screen there right on the home page so that when you go there it's right there waiting for you to uh, 
to watch. So uh, now that I've put a timetable on, on our website, uh, don't hold me to that. Things are subject to change. With Jesus, they're not, but with us, it is. Uh, so, amen. We'll stop there. <laughs>